Hello, I'm Douglas Stabila from the University of Waterloo, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity today to give you an update on the current status of post-quantum cryptography. Let me motivate the post-quantum problem. When you set up a secure connection to a website or some other uh, communication protocol, several forms of cryptography are used. For example, visiting the Serene Risk website, we see that the connection to the site was encrypted and authenticated using TLS 1.3 with several cryptographic algorithms. Looking at these cryptographic algorithms in a little more detail, we see two main families of algorithms used. Public key cryptography, in this case, the X25519 elliptic curve, is used for authentication and key exchange in the form of a digital signature scheme and Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Once the secure channel is established, the AES algorithm is used, an example of symmetric cryptography, to encrypt and authenticate application data. The public key algorithms used are based on difficulty of factoring large numbers or computing discrete logarithms. And these are the algorithms that would not be resistant to attack by a quantum computer. So this motivates the field of post-quantum cryptography, developing cryptographic algorithms that are secure against quantum adversaries. Of course, the big question then is when will a large-scale large quantum computer be built? There are a variety of estimates. Um, for example, my colleague Michele Mosca at the University of Waterloo in 2015 estimated a 1 in 7 chance of breaking RSA 2048 by 2026 and a 50% chance by 2031. The European Union issued a quantum manifesto with a timeline envisioning a universal quantum computer by around 2035. And more recently, uh, there's been a, a document prepared by my colleague Michele Mosca and an associate of his surveying experts on the likelihood of a quantum computer by a certain period of time. And I think Michele will talk more about that uh, in a later talk. So there are there is a pressing need to develop a uh, quantum resistant algorithms. That's the field of post-quantum cryptography. Cryptography that's believed to be resistant to attack by quantum computers. But importantly, Although it is supposed to be secure to attacks against quantum computers, it only uses classical non-quantum operations to implement it. And that contrasts it with things like quantum key distribution. Within quantum post-quantum cryptography, there are several families of mathematical assumptions that are used to build crypto systems. I've listed the five main families here, hash-based and symmetric algorithms, and multivariate quadratic, which tend to be used for building signature schemes and code-based, lattice-based, and elliptic curve isogeny assumptions that are, tend to be used for building public key encryption or key exchange protocols. So there are lots of options for post-quantum cryptography, but there are some trade-offs as well. Most of these mathematical assumptions have not been as well studied as current encryption, like RSA, which dates from the 1970s. As a result, we're a little less confident in their security. There are also more implementa implementation trade-offs. So we're really in this situation here where we have three characteristics we'd like, confidence in their quantum resistance, fast computation, and small communication. And with the algorithms we have available to us, we can pick at most two and sometimes less. But nonetheless, the, the need for quantum resistance means that we must start working towards standardizing post-quantum cryptography. And the current kick towards standardizing post-quantum cryptography was really initiated by the United States government in around 2015. In mid-2015, the NSA issued a statement saying that they would initiate a transition to quantum-resistant algorithms in the not-too-distant future. And the following year, the National Institute of Standards and Technology issued a call for proposals for post-quantum cryptography standardization. And that's been the focus of most of the work in the academic community uh, since then. So in 2016, NIST issued its call for proposals with a deadline of November 2017. At that submission date, the round one uh, submissions, there were 69 schemes that were submitted, of which about one third were signature schemes and two thirds were public key encryption schemes. Uh, about a year and a half of analysis uh, took place and many of the uh, proposed schemes were broken or had other flaws found in them. And uh, the field was narrowed to uh, a round two uh, cl collection, uh, where NIST invited uh, 26 schemes to uh, continue in the competition. Uh, there were nine signature schemes and 17 public key encryption schemes that made it through to round two. 
Again, there was about a year and a half of analysis. And after that year and a half, uh, NIST narrowed it down further. Uh, in earlier this month, uh, sorry, earlier in the summer, uh, NIST announced the round three candidates, which were due in uh, the beginning of October 2020. They were divided into two categories, finalists and alternates. And there were a handful of schemes, uh, both signature and public key encryption schemes, in each of these categories. And I'll talk about round three in a little bit more detail later. The current uh, plan for the standardization process is to have draft standards from the round three finalists uh, by around 2022 to 2023, with uh, public comment on the draft standards, aiming for a final standard in 2024. This is also said that there may be a round four, uh, which would take into account the alternate algorithms uh, after the draft standard for the round three algorithms, the round three finalists, has been prepared. So that's the timeline for the development of post-quantum cryptography standards. Will we be ready in time? Well, let's take a look at where we are. We're here in 2020, and NIST hopes to have draft standards by 2022 and a final standard by 2024. If we compare that with some of the estimates for when a quantum computer might be available, Mosca said a one in seven chance of breaking RSA 2048 by 2026, and a 50% chance by 2031, and the EU and the Quantum Threat Expert Survey um, has 20, 2035 as a potential time frame for a quantum computer. So if the quantum computers come in towards the beginning of this time period, then we're cutting it pretty close. But you might think that we are doing okay if quantum computers are a little bit further off. However, there are two major concerns with this timeline, even as it stands. The first is a security concern of retroactive decryption. An adversary can record encrypted communication now and decrypt it later once they have a quantum computer. And there are certainly nation state adversaries who are recording as much encrypted information as they can today. The second concern is that it takes time to deploy a replacement cryptographic algorithm. Let's look at a historical example. So in 1995, NIST standardized the SHA-1 hash function, and in 2001, standardized SHA-2, a potential replacement for SHA-1. SHA-1 was subsequently found to have some weaknesses in 2005. These weren't exploitable weaknesses at the time. The amount of computation required was beyond what was available to us, but it was a significant uh, decline compared to the expected security of the SHA-1 standard. It wasn't until 2017 that browsers stopped accepting certificates with SHA-1, a period of nearly 16 years from when the replacement SHA-2 was standardized and 12 years from when weaknesses were known. Now, fortunately, this came just in time because in August 2017, the first full collision for SHA-1 was found. But given, given this historical timeline, it makes the timeline for post-quantum cryptography standardization look rather tight. Nonetheless, let's talk about what's happening right now. Earlier this year, NIST announced the round three finalists and alternate candidates, and round three revisions were due at the beginning of October. NIST has divided the algorithms that made it through to round three into two categories, finalists and alternate candidates. And finalists are meant to be the primary focus of round three, with alternate candidates being potentials for standardization in a subsequent round four. Among the finalists in the key encapsulation mechanisms category, these are basically public key encryption schemes or key exchange algorithms. There are four algorithms. One is the classic MacLeese algorithm, which is a code-based cryptographic primitive. And it's based on the MacLeese cryptosystem, which dates all the way to the early days of public key cryptography, 1978. There are three lattice-based algorithms, Kyber, Entrue, and Saber, which all rely on structured lattice problems. And these have uh, several similarities, although some differences as well. NIST has said that at most one of these three lattice-based algorithms will be standardized. On the signature side, there are three algorithms. Two lattice-based algorithms, Dilithium and Falcon, which are again based on structured lattice problems and have several similarities, meaning NIST has said at most one of these two will be standardized, and a multivariate scheme called Rainbow. 
Among the alternate candidates, there are several key encapsulation mechanisms, two based on error correcting codes called BIKE and HQC, two more based on lattices, FrodoChem, which is based on unstructured lattices, and Entry Prime, which is based on structured lattices, and a new family called isogeny-based cryptography, based on isogenies between elliptic curves. And Psyche is the prime example of this family here. As for signature schemes, there are two symmetric-based signature schemes, Picnic and Sphinx. Sphinx is a hash-based signature scheme, and hash-based signatures also date from the very early days of public key cryptography, as well as another signature scheme based on multivariate quadratic uh, systems, uh, GEMS. Let's take a look at the finalists in a little bit more detail. There are several trade-offs between the performance characteristics of these finalists. In this graph here, I've shown you the public key and ciphertext size in bytes of the round three chem finalists as compared to existing classical algorithms, elliptic curve and RSA. Smaller is better in this graph. As you can see, the three structured lattice algorithms, Sabre, Entrue, and Kyber, have sizes that are around the same, 600 to 800 bytes. Um, this is relatively small, but you can see still much larger than we're used to with elliptic curve algorithms. The classic MacLeese crypto system has quite small ciphertext, only 128 bytes, which is you know, in the neighborhood we're used to for public key encryption, but has very large public keys, which is why um, it is not suitable for all applications. In terms of performance, here's the runtime in seconds for the key generation, encapsulation or encryption operation, and decapsulation or decryption operation. Again, smaller is better here. On the right, you can see the three structured lattice algorithms, Kyber, Entrue, and Sabre, which all have runtimes less than uh, you know, a millisecond. And this is comparable to the performance we expect from elliptic curve cryptography, and also uh, less than the performance, small, better than the performance we get for RSA cryptography. Classic MacLeese has pretty good encapsulation and decapsulation times. Its key generation time is a little bit slower um, on the order of several dozen milliseconds. If we take a look at the round three signature schemes, um, again, on the left-hand side, I have the public key and signature sizes, um, with at smaller being better here. Our structured lattice schemes, Falcon and Dilithium, are on the order of 600 to 2,000 bytes, which is not too bad, but again, larger than we're used to with elliptic curves. And the rainbow scheme has quite large public keys, but has the smallest signatures um, among the uh, round three finalists. Performance is shown on the right here. Um, and you can see that for the three round three algorithms, signing and verification is relatively fast. Um, key generation is a little bit slower for some of the algorithms. Uh, Falcon is around seven milliseconds and Rainbow is around three milliseconds. But all of these would have reasonable performance for most applications. NIST priorities for round three analysis are twofold, cryptanalysis and improving implementations. On the cryptanalysis front, they'd like to better understand the difficulty of the lattice-based schemes, the core SVP hardness and other metrics, and to know whether the choice of lattice structure matters. The goal is to help decide between the three structured lattice chems, Kyber, Entry, and Cyber, and decide between the two structured lattice signature schemes, Dilithium and, Dilithium and Falcon. They're also, also interested in implementations, understanding the ease of implementation for general implementations and side channel resistant implementations, as well as performance, including performance in internet protocols and performance for hardware implementations. I'll now briefly talk about some of the work we've been doing on preparing for the transition to post-quantum cryptography. A lot of this work is centered around the Open Quantum Safe project, which is an open source software project that I lead out of the University of Waterloo. The core of this project is a C language library called LibOQS that provides implementations of post-quantum key exchange algorithms and signature schemes under a common API. We've integrated this library into forks of OpenSSL, BoringSSL, OpenSSH, and others to provide implementations of post-quantum algorithms in the TLS protocol, X509 certificates, SMIME secure email, 
SSH, and other applications. And then we provide demonstrations of these uh, protocols in applications uh, like Apache's web server, or the OpenVPN client, or the Chromium browser. We have several industry partners involved in this research, as well as other contributors. We've used the technologies that we've developed in the Open Quantum Safe project to prototype post-quantum crypto in network protocols in a variety of settings. And I've listed some of the work we've done here, designing post-quantum and hybrid signatures in X509 certificates, evaluating whether post-quantum algorithms and their large sizes can even satisfy the constraints of the TLS and SSH protocols, as well as, in, as, well as measuring the performance of these algorithms when used in TLS. And on the right here, I've shown one graph from a paper that we worked on on that front, where we tried to measure the effect that packet loss and handshake and round trip times have on the completion time for handshakes. Some of the post-quantum algorithms have large public keys or ciphertexts, and we see, for example, that as packet loss increases, the amount of time it takes to establish a connection increases substantially for algorithms with long, larger communication sizes. We've also developed some internet drafts for the IETF specifying how to do hybrid post-quantum and traditional key exchange in TLS and SSH. We're also doing some work on taking new approaches to protocol design, and one of these is some recent work on designing post-quantum TLS without using signature schemes for authentication. The motivating problem here is that, as we saw in the earlier graphs, post-quantum signatures are bigger than post-quantum counts. And so communication, when using signature schemes, will be larger and potentially slower. Our idea is to use CHEMS for authenticated key exchange in the TLS handshake to save space. There are lots of neat things that happen if you're able to do that. It's simple to implement, and you can get much uh, improved sizes, including communication sizes that are much closer to the traditional algorithms we've used today. So we've got a, a paper that I hope you'll take a look at that explores some of those options. I just want to briefly mention some of the other work on post-quantum cryptography that's going on at the University of Waterloo. UW researchers are involved in two NIST round three finalists, Kyber and Andrew, and two NIST round three alternate candidates, Protochem and Psych. We have a large team led by my colleague David Zhao working on isogeny-based crypto, and a team led by my colleague Michele Mosca working on quantum cryptanalysis. We also offer a training program for graduate students and postdocs in quantum-resistant cryptography, and we have lots of work going on in quantum key distribution, quantum computing, and other applications of quantum information. Thanks very much for your attention today, and I look forward to your questions in the panel session.